Welcome in to Behind the Plate with Marin and Nate. And alongside Hale Varsity's college softball writer, Marin Angus Combs, I'm Nate Rohr, the play-by-play voice of Nebraska softball. And we are down to the final six games of the regular season in the Big Ten Conference, believe it or not. And you know, Marin, uh, we title these podcasts usually after we record them, you know, see where mm-hmm. it goes. I'm going to take the liberty of terming it from the start. Okay. Breaking Badgers. Uh, ah. Put the G-E-R-S in, in <laughs> parentheses. It's okay. I'm a dad. I can make dad jokes. I, <laughs> I am was... fully licensed. Wow. Uh, the Huskers win two of three from Wisconsin, and then the Badgers turn around and are swept in a doubleheader. Uh, in shutout fashion by Minnesota uh, in the midweek, the final midweek conference games to be played in the league. So uh, I I think it's safe to say the Huskers broke them. I would agree with that. It's hard to, it's hard to get swept and then to get swept by scoring zero runs. Yeah. uh, Especially with that Wisconsin offense. I mean, the Badgers, a pretty strong offensive team and, you know, we're able to put up some runs on Nebraska, not a huge number, of course, but six runs on Friday in that extra inning game. But I thought it was just a huge series for Nebraska to win. And we'll mm-hmm. get into the details of that series in a moment. We probably should tell you what else we're doing here on the podcast, though. Uh, Northwestern leads the conference 15 and two. They are three games up on Nebraska and Indiana, who are tied for second. And we are chatting with Northwestern's head coach, Kate Drohan, later on here on the podcast. We get an opportunity to chat with her about her team and the expectations that they've dealt with all season long. And of course, I know you're anxiously awaiting our updated Big Ten Power Rankings. So we'll get into all that as we go along here on the show. But as we mentioned, Nebraska wins two of three from Wisconsin. I thought it was just a gritty, tough Blue collar series win for Nebraska. The Huskers had to gut out the win, and especially Courtney Wallace. Better call Wall. Uh, so, okay, that that's all I've got for the Breaking Bad universe puns. I think I think you need to go back to bed. I, that's those are. <laughs> yeah. Hey, no, that's all right. That's all right. So, uh, but Courtney Wallace. 199 pitches Friday night, Nebraska's 7-6 win over Wisconsin, a 10-inning victory. And she didn't have her best stuff, walked eight, gave up nine hits, but boy, she, you know, she fights in the circle every time and no outing more so than Friday night. Yeah, I I was actually a little surprised they left her in <coughs> for the entire for the entire game because of what we've seen over the last few weeks where her and um, Sarah Harness have been splitting games. Right. Yeah. So to see Courtney go the distance, gut out the win because that was a gutsy performance. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, it, it fired me up. Yeah. It, it, it was not a pleasant night to try and play softball. The temperature started in the upper 40s and just got colder and colder and it was brutally windy so you you know both teams had to dig deep I- into their will to to put out a good game and nebraska runs out to the four nothing lead wisconsin to their immense credit puts up five straight runs then to get right back into the game and, and courtney's control issues got the better of her I- in those two innings but then Second half of the game, Wallace gives up just one run and the you know buy some time for her offense to come through for her. And uh, they were able to put up a couple of runs, force a couple of mistakes by Wisconsin, a team that pretty good pitching, pretty good hitting, but man, shoddy defense. And it yeah. bit them pretty badly on Friday night with five errors uh, against Nebraska, including uh, an error to set up run number five uh, in the uh, sixth inning, which tied the game, run number six in the eighth inning, you had an error and a passed ball. So you essentially gave Nebraska the last two bases uh, in, in a in a 
extra inning game, and the run to tie it, and then the game winning run, another error. So, you know, at the very least, you can give Nebraska credit for forcing mistakes, but at the same time, you have to know Wisconsin made those mistakes and opened the door for Nebraska to finally charge through and win that game. But just toughness, effort, hanging in there, and, and staying in that game long enough for them to make that mistake. Yeah, looking at, when you look at the box score overall, the, f- the first thing that you're going to see is Nebraska out hit Wisconsin 12-9. to mm-hmm. And and that you're looking at, oh, awesome. Okay, but yes, <coughs> Wisconsin had five errors. And those five errors, look, Matty Schwartz pitched a good game for Wisconsin. Sure. Zero earned runs. Mm -hmm. As a pitcher, that's frustrating, number Mm -hmm. one. Number two, as a coach, seeing that your defense play like that to open a series. Because to me, that kind of set the tone for the weekend. Right. Because at that point, if you're in Nebraska, you know that if you put the ball in play and you have to make the defense move, mistakes are going to happen. And I think we saw that play out throughout the weekend. And that gives you a lot more confidence as a hitter, knowing that, hey, I don't even have to hit the ball that hard, which uh, is good news because, I mean, Wisconsin has some good pitchers. Um, Peyton Monticelli on Saturday was very tough against the Huskers, scattered nine hits, gave up a couple hard hit balls, but was also able to pitch out of some jams and uh, Nebraska squandered some, some runners on opportunities. I think the big one, uh, was bases loaded, nobody out, heart of the order coming to the plate in the third inning, and you get nothing. nothing. You, right. I mean, that was a killer. But, you know, give Monticelli credit for how she pitched in that game. Uh, but at the same time, when when your defense is, is working or not working, as Wisconsin's is, uh, the opposing offense sits there and goes, all we have to do is put the ball in play. And, uh, you know, the run that Nebraska scored in the fourth inning was a direct result of an error. So, uh, you know, even on Saturday, uh, Wisconsin did enough to win, but at the same time, you felt like Nebraska had a chance to win that game. They had, like we said, bases loaded and the third didn't score, had the heart of the order up. In the seventh, and I I couldn't believe in the seventh, Nebraska wasn't able to get anybody on base. But, uh, you know, Wisconsin's got enough offensively. They had the big rally in the seventh inning. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about that because Sarah Harness uh, had pitched really well for six innings, Uh, had given up just one run, had given up just five hits, uh, walk three. And, And so Sarah... I think you felt like she could go one more inning. And especially with Wallace's workload the night before, I think the Nebraska coaching staff felt like, well, our best chance is Sarah Harness. Not to say Wallace couldn't have thrown an inning, but uh, the way Sarah was throwing for the first six innings, it made sense to send her back out there for the seventh. The decision just didn't work out. Yeah, I I agree with that because (coughs) after Wallace threw – 200 pitches Mm -hmm. you don't want to send her back out the next day not in in a high pressure situation you don't want to do that so but like you mentioned nebraska had opportunities in Mm -hmm. that game and they didn't get the timely hits same thing in that in the seventh inning what wisconsin made a pitching change too right right so monticelli throws hard yep um nebraska does a great job of hitting pitchers that throw hard and then they bring in Schwartz to close it <laughs> and Schwartz is an off-speed pitcher and holy smokes yep did she make that lineup look bad yeah it, it, it's spin it's it, it, slow <laughs> I mean it, it it's tough I mean that's a formidable uh, adjustment that you have to make between Monticelli and Schwartz and to do it in the middle of a game uh, is really difficult but Uh, You know, you think about what happened in that seventh inning and Harness was throwing well, gives up a double on the second pitch to Kate Linkletter, who was hitting roughly a buck 75 coming into that at bat. Two pitches later, single to right, uh, two pitches or one, the next pitch single to right to drive in 
uh, the third run to tie the game. And then Kayla Kahn went with an RBI ground out to drive in what was ultimately the winning run. I mean, there wasn't even a chance to get Courtney Wallace in the game. No. Even if the Nebraska coaching staff had been inclined to get her in, and maybe they would have considered it if they still had if they had time. But by the time things were wrong, they'd blown up. Yeah, you you know, they'd, they, they'd given up the lead. But uh, Wisconsin able to capture the game Saturday. And, and you talk about missed opportunities for Nebraska on the micro scale in that game. You also have a big missed opportunity on the macro scale because oh, yeah. just as Wisconsin was coming back to beat Nebraska 4-3, Michigan was annihilating oh, Northwestern. They, they took it to them. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 12 runs in the third inning. It batted around tw- twice. Is yeah, that right? Batted around twice in one inning. Oof. Against a Northwestern team. And again, we'll talk with Kate Drohan later on the podcast. Uh, against a Northwestern team that was a College World Series team last year that brought back everybody except Rachel Lewis, who was the Big Ten Player of the Year last year, but brought back basically the entire potent lineup. And to lose a game like that, yes, against Michigan on a very emotional day for them. They were dedicating the stadium uh, in the honor of Carol Hutchins, their legendary coach. But you expect that to propel you to a win. (laughs) You don't (laughs) expect that to to result in 15 runs. And, And so there was a chance for Nebraska to cut Northwestern's lead in the big 10 race to two games. Yeah. And unfortunately they weren't able to do it. And and that's maybe the one downer out of this weekend. And uh, obviously the the series against uh, or between Northwestern and Nebraska is still huge, right? Still has big implications. Um, But at the same time, they're really big implications for Northwestern. The best Nebraska can do is be a spoiler. Now, if they sweep the the conference uh, race is tied, but man, that that would be unbelievable. That would be unreal. Yep. Yeah, I honestly, I, I I know you were at the spring game on yeah. Saturday, and I was texting you in that yeah. as that third inning and in Michigan was happening. I'm like, oh man. They sent 18 batters to the plate and scored 12 runs. Yeah, That's, you can't come back from that. No, no. (laughs) Nope. Yeah, that was just, I mean, that was just bad. And at the same time, you know, Nebraska's got the lead. And I'm thinking, okay, like, yeah, this could be, this could be a way to pick up a game. And then that seventh inning happened and it just like it, it, they just, combusted right yeah. like unfortunately yeah. things blew up pretty quickly there was a husker error in that inning as well that uh, uh that helped wisconsin along i i made it over to bolin from memorial stadium at about the fourth inning and watched the last few innings so i saw that and i took it in and i was frustrated i it, it's tough to say where the team's head was i'm sure they were very disappointed yeah. But I was I was hurting <laughs> because you hate to lose a game that way. And, and also, it was an emotional series. I mean, the Wisconsin fan base was loud and present. Uh, and much to the displeasure of the Husker fans, there, there were a couple of instances where uh, the, the Wisconsin fans really irritated the Nebraska fans. And uh, and that added to the emotion and just turned the knife a little more um, that Wisconsin was able to come back and, and get that victory on a day that could have been really special for Nebraska. Yeah, it's just you you look back and it's oh, could have, would have, should have at this mm-hmm. point, you know, like, oh, man, what, you know, if we won that game, where would be where would we be sitting now? If we should have we should have done this, we could have done that. But like at this point, you can't. You can't sit there and, and yeah, you can't look back on it and think about that. Now you have to look ahead as to what's coming up with Northwestern, because like you said, this is the biggest series of mm-hmm. the season. Absolutely. And, and, you know, with all that 
with, with the disappointment of Saturday in play with what was ahead um, with, with Northwestern, I was really happy with the resolve Nebraska came with on Sunday. They, they pushed across two runs in that uh, second inning. Caitlin Neal with a two run double to get the Huskers ahead again, capitalizing on mm-hmm. Wisconsin mistakes and error to get Sydney Gray on. She moves to third on a pass ball. Then after a walk, uh, Neal with a with a two run double, and Courtney Wallace coming off the two hundred pitch outing on Friday. Um, Nebraska said, "Okay, make this stand up," and she did. And that's the mark of a senior, a tri-captain, a, a fifth year, somebody who chose to come back for this year. And, and you know, I, I've worn out the phrase, she has fought for this team, she has competed for this team, but that's what she does. I mean, her stuff's not overwhelming, but she finds ways to get people out. She finds ways to get through jams. She finds ways to get through weekends where she's asked to throw two out of three games she just keeps scrapping and fighting and getting the job done yeah and you you know that there are there are programs in this conference where they they rely heavily on the one pitcher Mm -hmm. and Courtney Wallace has been it for Nebraska she's thrown over 170 innings Mm -hmm. and she's tied for the lead and conference wins with 21 I'm I mean that you can't ask for anything more out of her no. at this point she's given you all that she's got and i think that was her mindset coming into the season was like this is it this is my last year i'm giving it everything that i have and she has and, and continues to and uh right now has been such a reliable part of this pitching staff and was able uh, to pick up that 2-1 victory she left 10 wisconsin runners on base she overcame five walks by the end of the game Wisconsin was starting to hit her hard uh and you know on another warmer day maybe those balls leave but they found a way to win they found a way to win that series again it solidifies Nebraska's NCAA resume now we should point out the Huskers fell a spot in the RPI after after the weekend uh down to 32 I I think at this point, Nebraska's a two seed somewhere and the somewhere is very likely Norman, Oklahoma. Yeah. And, and and unfortunately for the Huskers, I don't know that there's a great chance um, for them to avoid that Uh, because Oklahoma is bussable because Nebraska is going to profile in that low thirties range I think Nebraska is an attractive team to put on television. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's going to be very tough for Nebraska to avoid playing Oklahoma. Now, the one way you can avoid that is going up to Northwestern and winning two out of three. Yeah, I, but at the same time, it's not going to get you into an easier regional because if they win the series at Northwestern, what they're, they're rewarded by going to Stillwater. Right. Like, oh, like <laughs> it, no, it gets you into an easier regional. It's just infinitesimally smaller, <laughs> uh, the advantage or, or the, uh, the ease in the road that you have, uh, in, in the, uh, in the regional round because yeah, Stillwater looms, um, Oklahoma State could host, and and that would be just as tough this year as it was last year. Um, but obviously, you look at the Sooners, and they they're the top team in college softball. They're a cut above. They proved themselves early in the year with the win over UCLA, and it's they really rubbing. yeah it was, a, it was it was a run rule game. It was I yeah, <laughs> and so. With that, it's we we say, yeah, Stillwater would be a very tough regional, mm-hmm. and whoever is the two in that regional is going to have no easy road. Whether that's Wichita State, I think that's a very strong possibility. But at the same time, it's not Oklahoma. The Sooners have lost precisely one game. They've gone undefeated through the Big Twelve. Uh, they are who they are. Mm-hmm. They, they they have continued uh, to produce at the high level. So 
Unfortunately, I, I think a trip to Norman looms, but yeah, at the same time, it would be fun to, to test yourself against the best in the country. The Huskers have seen UCLA. They, and they played against them and lost and, and were run ruled. They got two shots at Oklahoma State, lost them both, were run ruled in the first one, and then played them much better in New Mexico. Um, it, it would be interesting on one level to see how they stack up with the Sooners, but at the same time, it's the Sooners. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, there's quite a bit of intimidation seeing that team on the other side of you. Yeah, and when you look at the Sooners, they lost their one game to Baylor early in the season. And then when they played Baylor in the three-game series this past weekend, uh, they swept Baylor. I mean, they swept them and shut them out. Shut them out in three games. like, yeah. And that's a good Baylor team that's going to be a second seed in the regional somewhere. Probably, most likely yeah. a two seed maybe in um, Fayetteville. Yep. Could be Fayetteville. Louisiana's a possibility. That's possible, too. Um, but, yeah, you look at Oklahoma's schedule, who they've played, who's hung hung around um, that that Nebraska's played against. And you look at Iowa State. Now, Nebraska was able to beat Iowa State in a midweek. Mm-hmm. And Iowa State hung in there in game one of their series against Oklahoma, losing 3 nothing. But the next two games are run rules. Right. So – that you know you give them what you have for one game and in a regional situation you're as a two seed you are expected to play them right to for the for the super regional berth but it's just it what they they are in that place that some programs get to where uh, you think of UConn basketball women's basketball yeah. at their peak even UCLA and Arizona at various times in in their softball histories where where they're up to nothing when they walk off the bus. Right. You know, I mean, you, you just you just don't know how you're going to deal with that. And we're, maybe we're we're talking about something that happens or doesn't happen. And of course, it's our job to speculate on a on a podcast. Right. Um, but it. All signs right now are pointing to that being the regional matchup for Nebraska. And it, it would be a big test. You know, the other thought would be it'd be tremendous exposure because the Sooners are probably going to get a very good TV window. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they're going to be prominently featured. I, I mentioned last week that D1 softball projected a regional of Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Arizona. Beth Mullins is at that regional. Uh, Michelle Smith's at that regional. They send their top crew to Norman. They'll probably do that anyway. Right. But you're getting on ESPN. You're getting big-time TV exposure at regionals, albeit against the best team in the country. Right. It, it, would, it would be interesting. It would be a big-time test. We... We shall see. Of course, we are down to the last two weeks of the regular season uh, in the Big Ten Conference. And uh, as you look at the final two weeks, and and we'll get in a little deeper uh, in our Big Ten power rankings, but Nebraska and Northwestern, this is how you drew it up in February. Mm-hmm. I, I think it was, I think you could reasonably sit down and, and say, Nebraska and Northwestern are your two front runners. You didn't know what Michigan was going to be with all of the departures out of that program and the retirement of Carol Hutchins. Minnesota was unproven. The, the Gophers have been very good lately, and they've played their way up in the conference standings. But I think most reasonable forecasts began the year with Nebraska and Northwestern, and that has come to pass. And so... Again, another great opportunity. Nebraska is an underdog. I, I think that's only fair to state that that the expectation is that Northwestern wins the series. But it's a great chance for Nebraska to go out and fight with a Northwestern program that right now is the standard in the Big Ten Conference. Again, with the retirement of Carol Hutchins, Michigan has kind of seeded that mantle. I think it belongs to Northwestern. Great chance for the Huskers to see where they are in this league. 
I would agree with that. And I think as we, we looked into the season, Northwestern was, was a preseason top 25 team. You had Dan, Daniel Williams, who was Mm -hmm. a top 10 player. You had all of these, all of these factors into Northwestern that just really made you say, okay, who's, who's the number two team? Yeah. Who's going to get them? Because there was no way anyone was going to get Northwestern. And I think that's been proven so far this Mm -hmm. season is that nobody's going to catch Northwestern. So here we are, we're looking at, I think, I think there's, there's five teams that have solidified a spot in Mm -hmm. the postseason um, after the big 10 tournament who maybe six, but I think five is a good number. I I would say six. Just looking at the RPI right now, Ohio State had a bad weekend. Um, Losing a couple of games to Purdue, uh, a a struggle and that's a bad weekend. That that is that's a bad weekend, and yet here they are, as they usually are, about thirty six. They're thirty six in the RPI as we discuss things today, but uh, you know they are fifth in the league, tied with Michigan at ten and seven, and they have the tiebreaker for whatever that's worth um over the Wolverines but I think Ohio State's a regional team so that gets you six I don't know that that there's much else for this conference unless Maryland or Wisconsin makes a run at the Big Ten tournament um you know Penn State oddly has a very high RPI and yet they're sitting there 26 and 14 overall 7 and 10 in the league <laughs> I, I was driving <laughs> and fueling and pushing the Penn State bandwagon at one point this season. I, I, I am surprised by their RPI, they're at least fringy regional. I don't know that I buy that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that they are on the, on the verge of regionals to where a good finish would put them into postseason. No, because Penn State's sitting at 42 in the RPI <coughs> and Missouri is at 43, Arizona's at 44. If we're talking about air, but if we're talking about Arizona, yeah, getting in at a 44 RPI, you, you kind of have to take Penn State into consideration being being above them. But also we're looking at Missouri and that they're not playing well. Right. In a tough conference. In a tough conference. However, if you look at some of these bracketology predictions, Mizzou is out. Well, it's true. So if Mizzou's out, Arizona's in, okay, well, you know, Maryland isn't too far behind. Arizona State is at 47. I think they're they're first four out right now. Yeah. Um, but you just keep looking down the list and some have Virginia in Virginia's sitting at 51. Huh. And, and Virginia was a, a Nebraska first weekend opponent and the team that I thought was nice, but maybe not a regional team. And of course uh, it, that was all the way back in February and teams can grow and develop in the interim. But of course, high interest in the next really three weeks of softball, the two Weeks of Big Ten play yet to go, where we will crown a Big Ten regular season champion. It could happen this weekend if Northwestern is able to win the series. They'll mathematically clinch uh, the Big Ten championship. And Nebraska can play their way back into a tie, but they would need to sweep. Um, The road's pretty long for the Huskers to win the Big Ten championship. But uh, a second place finish, second straight, second place finish in the league to a Northwestern team that went to the Women's College World Series last year and I think would be a favorite to win a regional this year. I think mm-hmm. that's a pretty nice note of progress for Ronda yeah. Ravel's program. Yeah, I, and I think a, a second place finish is very respectable. I think we are, we're also looking ahead to to the last regular season series for each team, right? Nebraska's mm-hmm. got Ohio State, Northwestern has Rutgers. Yeah. So when you look at that on paper, you say, okay, this weekend is it because there's no way Rutgers is going to catch Northwestern. No. And Ohio State, if they're a postseason team, that series against Nebraska 
could be really tough. Yeah. Uh, Ohio State will be loaded for bear. Yeah. They, they've they've got to put it all out there and, and make their case on the road uh, that they that they are a regional team and, and they'll try and do so uh, next weekend against Nebraska. They have a great series this weekend at home against Minnesota. I mean, there's there's another team that that has kind of played their way into regional consideration. Uh, again, the doubleheader sweep of Wisconsin yesterday. That helped. That helped them yeah. a bunch uh, and, and only further strengthened their case. But uh, really a couple of great series this weekend in the Big Ten Conference, Minnesota at Ohio State, uh, Indiana, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin at Maryland. That's That's a series of some note, but of course, Nebraska and Northwestern is is really the big show here, and and um, we'll we'll have the biggest say in in the Big Ten championship picture uh, before it's all said and done. For Northwestern, I I do believe that they're playing for a national seat at this point. Yes, and they're not just any national seat; they're they're playing for a top eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, their RPI is nine, um, and for them to be a top eight seed, I think not only is great for the conference, but it secures them home field through supers. Right, and that's what they're looking at. Yeah, you you want the straightest straightest path to Oklahoma City uh, as really any team, especially especially a favorite like that, the last thing Northwestern wants to do is do what they had to do last year and hop on a plane and, and go to Arizona State. Um, they're, they're looking good. Ninth right now, they'll play Nebraska. I think that'll help their their RPI. They've played a very difficult schedule. Um, do you really, right now, so you're the, the team's in the neighborhood. You've got Tennessee at seven. I think the Lady Vols, Get it. Yeah. Uh, they, they're they leading the SEC. For what it's worth, LSU is fifth in, in the RPI, which I'm I'm not buying. I, I No, that, I don't. That's too high for them. Yeah. I don't think that LSU is a better team than Tennessee. Right. Or Northwestern for that point, for yes. that matter. Yep. Um, so when we look at when we look at what our national seeds are, mm-hmm. Oklahoma lock at number one. Yes. Okay, UCLA probably, probably a lock, lock at, at number, number two. two. Uh, and then we get to number three. I lean towards Oklahoma State. I'd buy that, sure. And Stanford is hanging out here at the top of the RPI. They got mm-hmm. swept by UCLA, though. Yeah, they that's did. they got swept. Um, are they a top five team? Maybe I I, I could put them at four. You pretty at four? pretty pretty happily. And then, honestly, I would have, I agree, Tennessee at five, Florida State at six, and then you have an LSU make an appearance. Maybe, yeah. Um, Duke is up here, uh, Northwestern. I think that if you want, if Northwestern wants an eight, great. Duke, Texas. Yeah. Um, I have a tough time buying the Longhorns, but I know that's they partially just, they my They just Husker swept bias. Oklahoma State. So. True. They just swept them. Um, uh, you know, there's just so many things. Louisiana, I listen. The Cajuns are they worthy of a host? Regional, yes. Supers, no. Okay, fair. So, however that lines up, I'm going to tell you this now. Uh huh. They're going to line up LSU and Louisiana for a super and a regional. Super. Yes, I will. The hundred percent. So if wherever LSU gets, if LSU gets a top eight, great, fine. Wherever they are, Louisiana will match up with them for a super regional. <laughs> it, it history has proven that that is what's going to happen. The, yeah, the the NCAA and the uh, folks at ESPN love putting LSU Louisiana on TV. And I mean, hey, for what it's worth, you take the RPI. LSU's at five and Louisiana's at 11. All you have to do is bump the Cajuns down to 12 and boom, you've got, right. You, you've got that aligned. So whole lot of intrigue, whole lot of uh, things that we need to uh, 
uh, determine in these next two weeks. And of course, in the Big Ten Conference, Northwestern and Nebraska, I think, are going to pretty well settle who's going to be the conference champion um, here this weekend. Well, a huge series this weekend of the Big Ten Conference. The top two teams in the league scoring off at Sharon J. Drysdale Field as Northwestern, 15-2 and two in the league, faces off with Nebraska, the Huskers at 12-5 and five in the conference. And we're pleased to be joined by the head coach of the Northwestern Wildcats, Kate Drohan. And uh, Coach Drohan, you guys, obviously 15-2 and two on the year in the league. You have to feel good about where your team is right now. What's impressed you the most about what your team has been able to do through 40 games of the regular season? Well, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Thanks for your coverage of our uh, of the league. Uh, you know, it's been a really fun season. Obviously, the big story of our season are five of our se- uh, super seniors coming back um, for this year. And it's been really fun to see our team come together and gel and kind of create what our, our vibe is this year and how we're working together. Um, we really challenged them early. You know, we played a really tough non-conference season, played in a lot of a lot of tough games, a lot of different venues. Um, and I feel like once we came back and kind of settled into the Big Ten, our team's got great focus. Um, you know, it just came off a really exciting series at Michigan. Uh, and we're excited to get back home. So you're talking about this last series against Michigan. Michigan has been like this this sneaky little team right this year, which is kind of weird for us to say. But um, similar – series against uh nebraska where there's that one game right there was that one game where you're just like oh oh no (laughs) uh (laughs) um but when we talk about this this conference and what it what it's like what have you seen overall like we're talking about how many teams we get into the postseason right now um what are what are your thoughts well, I'll, I'll say this. I've said this to whoever will listen, right? It's like this is the most depth we've ever had in our conference. Really, it, it's every game has been such a battle. Every game on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So different pitchers have, have stepped up during different times. Um, you know, and, and it's been a lot of fun. I think you have to credit the coaches in the league. They've done a great job of developing some players. We have some freshmen who are really making some noise. So um, it's been a lot of fun. And, and I think our success has really stemmed from the fact that we have a bunch of veterans on our team who understand like what it feels like to have to play a double header that, that really matters, you know? And so there, our focus, our narrow focus on one game at a time has served us well up to this point. Chatting with Kate Drohan here on behind the plate with Marin and Nate. And you talked about creating the vibe for this team and, 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 how that was going to be different from last year. You guys were a College World Series team last year. How tough is it for a team that brings back so many pieces from the year before uh, to kind of create their own success and kind of create their own path uh, for the next season to where it feels fresh, to where it kind of feels like their own as opposed to just kind of a rehash uh, of what you did last year? Yeah, you know, it, it took time. Honestly, it took time. And um, I say this to our players all the time, you know, as a a player, as a junior is different than a player as a senior, you know, college is such a time of growth and development. And so they're learning and growing. So we try to look at each year as a real standalone year. And yet we did some pretty special things last year. We built some really great habits that we wanted to pull into this year, but also respect that this, that this was a new journey, a special journey, a unique journey for these women. Um, So it took us some time to kind of settle into that. And I also think early on, I think our team, they were battling some really high expectations and they needed to kind of settle into that and play free and play loose with that. Um, and I think I think we've figured out how to do it. Um, I like where we are. I, I think we have a huge challenge in front of us. Um, but the way our team is really focusing on kind of the, the details of the game and, and they have a very disciplined approach. Um, it'll be a lot of fun this weekend. One of the things that stood out to me about your club this year, I was I happened to be at the Mary Nutter tournament this year, and um, Jordan Rudd was on a billboard. Mm, like, how about that? Jordan Rudd was on a billboard right outside, mm. and, right outside the ballpark. Just what does that say about like your not just your team, but the, the type of player that Jordan is? Well, Jordan, Jordan has been our point guard. That's what I always refer to her as, you know, she's been so steady behind the plate. I think there was one season where she literally caught every pitch of the year. 
you know, so you think about her durability, you think about how well she knows our staff, her softball IQ is just through the roof. So I think, I think when, you know, we, when we pulled up on the bus, the first day we were playing, you know, our team had the same reaction, you know, <laughs> but these women have earned it, you know, the, the, just so far this season, when you look at the TV numbers, you look at the attendance numbers throughout the big 10. I mean, it is unbelievable how many sellouts standing room only we've had and we've played in front of. Um, so it's great stuff. You know, I think our sport is at a really exciting point right now, in particular our conference. You talk about Jordan Rudd dealing with your staff. And of course, coming into the year, Danielle Williams got a lot of the headlines, uh, the reigning big 10 pitcher of the year. She was your workhorse last year and driving you to the women's college world series. She's had a good year this year, but it's really been more of a staff approach this year. Lauren Boyd has been more prominent. How has that transition gone in how you use your staff and how your pitchers work together? You, you know, you, you mentioned Danielle's year last year. I mean, her numbers were gaudy, right? And, mm -hmm. and she's just worked so hard for our program. She worked so hard for her team. But going into this season, um, Michelle Gascoigne, our pitching coach, won a national championship at Oklahoma. She's really developed a staff, and, you know, and we have to give her all the credit. She came in with a really clear vision of having everyone ready to go, using them in different ways, maybe a starter, middle reliever, save situation. So our pitchers are really prepared uh, for really whatever the game asks of them. And so I, I think that they, they're having a lot of fun with that. You know, you, you see when they hand the ball to each other on the mound, you know, it's like, okay, let's go. It's your turn now. So, so there's a lot of great support there. But again, Michelle's really prepared them for these moments. When I look at pitchers in, in general, this is across the landscape. Um, it seems like with, with the amount of TV time that the sport is getting, there's a lot of film out, right? Mm -hmm. So it, to me, it feels like um, pitchers always have to be developing, like year to year. You've got to be able to come out, whether it's a new pitch or, or bettering pitch, uh, pitches that you already have. Um, what have you seen just in, in your time coaching this game that, I mean, of – of that type of development. Well, I think you're right. I think, I think the video and the analytics piece has really exploded within our game, right? So we know more information about our opponent than we ever have before and vice versa. So our games now are about a games, game, game of adjustments. You know, we, we try to see their approach. We try to counter it. Um, you know, and you, you've got to be able to spin the ball, a lot of different zones. You've got to be able to get hitters out different ways, especially when the three game series, the way our conference is set up. So it's a lot of fun. You know, a lot of it feels a lot like a chess match. And that's why we feel like having so many different looks um, is really a benefit for us. You look just how we split the Sunday game against Michigan with Lauren Boyd and Danielle Williams, being able to change a pitcher three and a half innings in, um, you know, it, it's 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 been working for us. Um, but but again, it's it's I have to credit Michelle with with how she game plans and then how she makes in game adjustments. Chatting with Northwestern head coach Kate Drohan here on Behind the Plate ahead of their big series with Nebraska. And you talked about the schedule you guys played, and you guys typically play a, a tougher schedule. This year it made a lot of sense to do so uh, because of the veteran team that you had, but generally you guys challenge yourselves in the non-conference about as much as anybody in the country uh, what makes your program uniquely qualified to, to take on that tough a schedule as a Northern program every single year? Well, I think two things really help us. I think the first is it's, it's, it's part of our tradition. It's part of our culture. We kind of wear it like a badge of honor, you know? So it's expected when you come in as a freshman that, Hey, you're going to be challenged right away. You're going to face all Americans in February. You're going to really understand what the speed of the game is all about, you know, and, and that's why we try to play different teams from different conferences. Um, and, and that's I in my mind, I think, number one, players love to play great games. They love to play meaningful games. And it also really challenges them to develop a lot faster, you know, and, and I think that's been true in every year. Um, I think the second thing that really enables us to do is because we're so centrally located in Chicago, we can go nonstop direct anywhere we, anywhere we want to in the country. So we've got a lot of different options and that's where we've, we've been really spreading it out. So I think that travel really helps us as well in, in February and in early parts of March. Um, but I think if you ask our team, they'd, they'd much rather play a really quality opponent, a really meaningful game than not. When you're setting up your schedule, um, do you keep in mind like uh, an 
an average RPI of opponent or anything like that? Well, I think a good balance. I, I, I think, you know, there, there's math to it. You know, there, there are lots of different layers to it. Um, so we want to be purposeful in terms of how we're building it. Uh, but we also think about what venues we want to play in, uh, what kind of crowds we want to play in front of, different styles of play. You know, there are some teams in the ACC, they're going to play a little differently than the Pac-12 and the SEC. So we want to just kind of get our team prepared for all different styles of play as well. We'll get you out on this, Coach Drohan. Of course, huge weekend for you uh, with Nebraska coming in. An opportunity, if things break right, to clinch a Big Ten championship. Uh, and also on Saturday, Coach Drysdale is going to be back in the house uh, as part of the celebration of Title IX. Uh, what does this weekend mean for your program uh, between the importance of the games and also the celebrations around them? Yeah, I, I think you're right. A lot of things that are going to be happening – um, kind of off the field are really meaningful and really special to our program. We're so excited to welcome Drysdale back um, and to honor her in what she's done in terms of Title IX and also specifically for our sport and most importantly for Northwestern softball. You know, she's someone who's stayed in really close contact with our team and with our players. And, um, you know, she she was down at Hall of Fame Stadium already this year, was at the World Series last year. So she, she sees us quite a bit. Um, and to be able to honor her and to really thank her, it's going to be pretty cool. Um, but I think the key is for us to focus on what's happening between the lines, you know, and, and between senior day or perhaps what's riding on these games. You know, what I say to them all the time is put your focus on the game and then you can reflect later on, on how meaningful these moments were. So I think our team's pretty dialed in. I think, um, I think we'll have to settle in, but I think we're excited about the opportunity ahead. Could be a very special weekend, probably will be a special weekend for your program, whether, you know, whether a championship is clinched, it's going to be some high level softball and a uh, very exciting weekend for uh, Northwestern softball. And we thank you for joining us this uh, here on uh, Behind the Plate with Marin and Nate ahead of a big weekend. Thanks so much. Appreciate being on and go Cats. Coach, thanks so much. We'll uh, uh, I'll be out there uh, this weekend. So we'll uh, we'll see you then. Awesome. Thank you. You betcha. Take care. That was Kate Drohan, the head coach of Northwestern softball. And now it's time to flip on the power. It is the Big Ten power rankings. Marin, you release yours weekly on hailvarsity.com, but we get a preview of them here on Behind the Plate with Marin and Nate. Please, could you give us your top? Give us your top four. Top Let's, four. Yep. Okay. Northwestern, Nebraska. I have Minnesota at three right now. Mm. I think they're playing well. Yeah. And, you know, my power rankings more of focused on the right now, right? Okay. Week to week right now, Indiana at four. Okay. So I've got Michigan at three. I was pretty impressed by what they were able to do against Northwestern in that, in the blowout win Saturday. Otherwise, I concur directly with you. Northwestern proved themselves best team in the Big Ten right now. Uh, Nebraska gets their shot to uh, make the opposing argument this weekend, but the Huskers are second best. Mm -hmm. They're number two. I've got Michigan three, and then Indiana four. Maybe I, I'm not entirely sure that I don't have them a little too high right now, That's fair. Um, but at the same time, you can't totally sell, sell them off. Um, but they've got a big weekend against Michigan coming up. So uh, it'll be another chance to examine where Indiana is after uh, Nebraska was able to sweep that series from them. Okay. So top four, pretty similar. Can you round out your top half? So five, yeah. six, seven, five, six, seven, uh, Michigan, five. Ohio mm -hmm. State six, and I have Iowa at seven. It's I think from seven on down are pretty mm. interchangeable. Um, I don't. That's that's dropping Iowa for me. I know you've uh -huh. probably dropped them a lot lower than that, but they're twenty second in my rankings. Yeah. No. No. They're no. Not. But okay. I've I just I've I'm like okay seven eight nine. I just feel like they all could be there in any given order. Yeah, I I, I would agree with that general assessment. Um, fives where I have Minnesota, 
maybe I'm not by, you, you know, I said, I've got Indiana, maybe a touch high. I feel like I've got Minnesota, maybe a touch low. Uh, again, the series at Ohio state this weekend will be a great chance for them to kind of state their case to me. And I know they're, they're sitting there motivated, trying to prove me wrong. But uh, Minnesota 5, Ohio State 6, and uh, depending on how things go in Columbus, that could flip-flop. I've got Wisconsin at 7. Um, maybe I should have punished them a little more for not just losing the series at Nebraska, but also losing both games to Minnesota. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not entirely ready to sell off on Wisconsin. Uh, they've got a, a reasonably... Uh, entertaining series lined up at Maryland this weekend. So um, should be a fun series out in College Park. So um, I, Wisconsin rounds out my top five, but I do agree with your basic idea that, you know, we, we've set a shelf of about six, right? Yeah. The six teams that we're talking about for regionals. Um, and then there's about a six-team five team, six team group where yeah. it's, where it's all pretty tight. And then the last two, but at any rate, uh, take us into your bottom half, the bottom, the uh, next four. Yeah. So my next four here, Wisconsin, Maryland, back to back eight and nine. Mm -hmm. So this weekend we'll give one of them the opportunity to kind of separate themselves from that. Uh, Penn state at 10 mm -hmm. Rutgers at 11. I, I, I I'm, Pretty close there. Um, I'm going to go Iowa 8. Uh, they've been playing well, and and uh, though they lost to Minnesota this weekend, but I, I do like what I've seen from the Hawkeyes. I've got Penn State 9, and, uh, you know, they've broken my heart, Penn State. I know they have. Yeah, I'm, I'm scorned. Um, I'll go Maryland 10 and then Rutgers at 11. I Rutgers has been kind of tough. They've kind of hung in there, but they really haven't been winning lately. No, they're on an eight game losing streak. Yeah. And so when I look at that, I'm like, okay, we're, they're just going to keep falling. And then you have Illinois, right? I have yeah. Illinois at 12. Um, they're on a three game winning streak. So how about them, Alina? How about it? So yeah, Rutgers, I, I think to start the year, people saw some gaudy numbers. Yeah. And maybe thought about, oh, Rutgers, are they for real? And then conference play started, and people are now like, no, they're not. No, no, they, they, it was answered in the negative. All right. So Illinois is at 12 for you, round it up. Yep. Illinois at 12, Purdue 13, Michigan State 14. In a shock. My bottom three are the same. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I I wish I I wish I could drum up some drama. Yeah, Purdue had a had a decent weekend for them at Ohio State, but um, but yeah, I think we've pretty well set the bottom three teams. And right now, the mission for Illinois is just get in the conference tournament that's being played in your home facility. I mean, there yeah. is nothing worse than having the conference tournament at home in your stadium and you not playing in it. Yeah. That happened in the SEC. Yes, uh, it did. No, I'm trying to remember who. Was it Mississippi? Mississippi State. Oh, Mississippi State. That's who it yeah. was. Um, <clears throat> ironically, the next year, the SEC changed their postseason rules to where everyone gets in now. Uh, <laughs> what do so, you know? Uh, I think, are we looking at a situation like that? Has the Big Ten had that before where the host doesn't make the tournament? I, I'm trying to remember because the Big Ten tournament, at least since Nebraska has joined um, the conference, um, I think the Big Ten, uh, the, the, the host school has made the Big Ten tournament every year. And I could be wrong on this, but I feel like they met Michigan state made it last year. Correct. Like not <laughs> they, like they were at a bunny bracket game. Yeah. But, um, but they, I feel like they got in and then trying to think about the rest of it. There, there really isn't. I mean, part of it is if your facility is good enough to host the big 10 tournament, then 
then you as a team probably, and you as a program have to be at least good enough to get in. Exhaustive research has revealed what? That Michigan State did make the tournament last year go. and they lost to Maryland seven to one in their only game. In the final game of the Jackie Joseph era. That was. Yeah. How about that? That was. Yeah. Um, so, oh, and then they also did not play their last three games of the regular season. Oh, yeah, that's right. There was there was some controversy involved with that. That's I, that's probably what got them in, right? I believe so, yes. Uh, <laughs> and now, now that you mention it. <laughs> I think I think that's how that went down, and I think there was some gnashing of the teeth. But um, I don't think there will be any such chicanery this year to get the fighting Illini in. But hey, you never know. You never know. No, that's that's interesting. Now I'm I'm new to the Big Ten, but when you look at last year's schedule for Michigan State, and it says no contest, <laughs> smells fishy. Yeah, yeah. At any rate. Well, hopefully, the only fish are the ones on uh, dinner plates uh, in Champagne or Urbana. I, I enjoy me some catfish, so if that could be arranged, that would be a good thing. But catfish. Oh yes. All right, Big Ten power rankings, and you know they're starting to solidify. And I think we've we, we've kind of shaken out the Big Ten. We've gotten a good idea of where things are. I got to say, this conference has kind of played true to form this year. I mean, yeah. obviously, Northwestern came in as the favorite. They have pretty much been the best team in this league. Indiana had their hot streak. Uh, Nebraska's been up there basically the entire time. Michigan has had their lull, but they're they're back in, in where they should be. I, it, it just feels like the conference has kind of gone to script this year. It, yeah. After the way the season started, when you had a team like Maryland mm -hmm. that kind of, that took took everyone by surprise, uh, I, I thought maybe we would end up with a little bit different outcome. Mm -hmm. But as the season has played out, I think that the teams that are going to postseason are the teams that we <coughs> expected yeah. to play in the postseason. Yep. And, you know, that just goes to show how brilliant we are in, our, in exactly. the setting of our expectations. Yes. But, uh, you know, it, it also goes to show, especially in the COVID era, and, and we're coming to the end of it. Yeah, but yeah, that's weird to think about. Yeah, how about that? But veteran teams have such an advantage because they've lived through the battles before. Right. And we heard Kate Drohan talk about that, how, how her team – has dealt with a tough schedule, has dealt with uh, having to play, you know, conference doubleheaders that have a whole lot of meaning to them. A and they've lived through all that and come through it successfully. So uh, the fact that that the season has kind of gone to script, I, I suppose we, we should have expected that, that, that Northwestern, with all the experience they have, all the experience they brought back and all the success they had last year, that that would all add up to them being the best team of the Big Ten, at least through the first 40 games. And when we talk about that COVID era, I mean, you look at Northwestern's roster, that's six grad players. <laughs> it's crazy. That's hard to beat a team coming off of a World Series appearance. With, with that much with six grad players yeah exactly exactly but the huskers will try to do it this weekend up at sharon j drysdale field the three-game series this weekend between nebraska and northwestern we'll talk about that and everything going on in big 10 softball next week the regular season finale edition oh. I'm so sad. Behind the plate with Marin and Nate. But we are just getting to the good stuff, aren't we? We are. Postseason, it's been a fun journey, and the journey continues and comes to at least one milestone next week. Until then, for Marin Angus Combs, I'm Nate Rohr. Thanks for